Yo, what's up, peeps? Matty D here from The Black, where we help you achieve uh, emotional, financial, and physical well-being, and also your relationship code. Come to your parents. So this is the third and last part of my story here. Um, it's gonna be a bit long, like just like the other, just like all the other, all the other videos. Um, I decided not to, do, to not do to not. Bleh. I decided to not do this one live because, with the with the with the whole live casting thing, my computer and. And this, on this YouTube channel, um, it, it doesn't allow me to do live on my phone yet. Um, they can on my other YouTube channel, and also I, I just felt like if I did it live, it just like lag, and I don't want to go through that stuff. So, um, this part is the last part. I want to do. I don't want to do this in four parts unless people want more. Let me know. Um, I'll try to fit it in as much as I can. All that is relevant. So I know that when we last spoke. When we last spoke, when I last, when, when I left off last time, I talked about um, how I uh, had cussed at my mom for the first time in a long, for the first time ever in my life, and I had released a whole other, like pent up anger that I hadn't dealt with. And I remember after doing it, feeling bad. I was I felt worse than I did before I did it, which is the funny thing. Take note of that. If you always want to tell your parents how you really feel, and you finally tell them in a way, it's like you're angry, you're just yelling at them, you're not going to feel, there's a good chance, you won't feel better than you did before. You think you will, but you don't. Unless your parents truly like, you know, just truly at lost. Even then, there's still a possibility that you may not feel the greatest afterwards. But anyway, so I'd done that, and that's where I got kicked out and living, started living with, living with my dad. And I remember him hugging his girlfriend and, and crying and feeling like feeling like all oh, this is his fault like and it's not fair to him it's not his fault you know no one tells us there's no real marketing out there or message that says hey if you want to make sure you marry the right person and and, have, and, and and procreate with them here's how to choose the right partner no one really tells you that and we're left we're left with what we grew up with and what we're taught and as you can see in the east united states how many marriages and divorce and those that are and those that don't divorce how many of those are actually happy marriages like it's not a whole lot a lot of people get married and if they don't divorce it's like they're still hating themselves i mean even after they get divorced and meet someone else they're still unhappy in their relationship it's like we as people continue to get into create this life of unhappiness like we're subconsciously focused on that which is jacked up so anyway so i got kicked out I'm digressing. And then that's when a lot of things in life became harder than needed to be. And as of, you know, and I needed to still need a cosign for a loan. And uh, my grandmother, my dad's grandmother, after me going through so many people and feeling stressed out about stuff, and I didn't want to go to, to community college. And even though there was still a possibility, but I'd already accepted going to Maryland. And I'm like, I want to go there. So she cosigned, I got in, and then, um, it was at this moment in time actually where my before she before she said she's gonna co-sign, um, we started looking into the military. And I first was gonna do the Air Force because um, my grandfather, my dad's father, was in was in the Air Force, and uh, my uncle Aaron before he passed away was in, was in the Air Force too. So I was like, hey, and I want to do psychology. So I was like, hey, I'll go in the Air Force and pay for my school. We do psychology. My life is set, or so I thought. So we think things are. Um, so I remember going to the recruiting station nearby and I wanted to go there, they wanted to go to the Air Force one and it was closed. And then I see this guy in his car, uh, for a different branch and he goes, who are you looking for? And my, my dad's like, we're looking for Air Force. And then the guy goes, how about the Marines? And smiles. And I was like, no. My dad looks at me, looks at him and goes, we'll talk. And that is when I ended up being sold on the Marine Corps. And that was interesting. I was very afraid of it. I was against it, but those the recruiters from Marine Corps, if you get you if you get a good one who knows how to sell, oh my god. I was sold on the whole like you be part of the few and the proud, no one mess with you. You I mean it's 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 tough to get in and you dress blues and all the benefits of it and you know being told that boot camp's gonna suck. Which it did. So Joined the Marine Corps, and I did the reserves, so I was still in school. Um, I ended up going to, did my first semester at College Park, then went to boot camp, which was 
on, which was such an experience where I still have dreams of having to do boot camp all over again, where I'm saying intention, talking in third person, and I go, oh shit, like, how the fuck did I end up doing this again, like, again? So, and in the meantime of this stuff, I'm still having issues with my mother, and there's a period where I don't really speak to her. I would go months, you know, without texting. Not even texting, like, I just wouldn't talk. And I got my first real relationship with, with my first real relationship before I went to boot camp, while I was in boot camp. And, you know, when I graduated boot camp, that was a very happy, proud moment in my life. And there's pictures of me where I'm skinny as shit. I'm pretty much, I think, at this point in my life, I'm as skinny as I was when I got out of boot camp. Um, I can share stories, short stories about that from what I learned on, on a different, different time. But from there, going to school, and the struggles I faced were trying to get financial aid. I joined the Marine Corps because I thought, and I, what I was told was, you know, hey, I still, I still get tuition assistance. Well, as of right now, as far as I know, um, there is no tuition assistance for the Marine Corps Reserves. If you're active duty, yes. So what I found out is that in Marine Corps Reserves, if you want to get tuition, tuition assistance, pretty much, um, and this is, of course, but I got to figure this out too still, before the whole, I think, 9-11 bill was passed, and what still is that if, if I want to get money for school, I would have I would have to been been deployed for you know six months to a year, and come back and been eligible for stuff like that. I never was deployed. I got lucky. I didn't want to be deployed anyway. But then again, you know, it's like joining Marine Corps. It's like you're joining people who are the first ones to go out to fight. I'm smart. So throughout this whole period, I remember going to drill and hating it. You know, drills the the whole one weekend out of the month, and I wasn't very motivated. I did. I realized that like this wasn't for me, and it really sucks to be in something where you get into it and you think it's good and you think you're gonna, you know, it's gonna be great, and you get into it and you're locked in something, and you have the realization that you go, "Holy shit, this is not for me," and that sucked because I'm like I'm in a contract with something and I don't want to break it because if I do, you get the Disarmable discharge, and you're like, well, shit. So I decided to stick it out. Wasn't best Marine. I could have been a lot better. I was more motivated outside of it than there, and I didn't want to, I just didn't want to do anything. It was bad. And I really, I still look back at myself for that. I still don't really forgive myself, which I need to, for that period, because I could have done more. I wanted to do more, but at the same time, it was like, I didn't want to fully embrace all of it. Now was the problem. I wanted to do my select things, what I liked, where I really didn't like, you can't really do that in life with certain things. So from there, um, things my mother never really got better. Um, it was still strange. We would talk every now and then. I still had arguments with her over the phone. I remember one time I was with my first, my first girlfriend, and my mom was like, "You can't talk to me like this." You know, I, th I thought the military would teach you something, and I and I snapped back, and I was like, "I said, listen, you're not my commanding officer. You can tell me what to do." I hung up the phone. So my mother, to to this day, still at that point, thinks that she is God. She thinks that she is because she gave birth to us. She has this this control. Thing of where she's she's like always gonna be respected and, and it's just like you can't have that because as you get older you go you can't even what to do anymore plus I don't live with you anymore and I don't depend on you for money or anything so why still maintain this power position that is total that's a total lie and bullshit but you want to make it true when it's not but that's not for me to, to, to correct her to the point that's something she has learned the hard way and that's the lesson I had to learn. Just going through all this stuff with her. And like, I remember just being living at my dad's house a lot. And then always going to him about my mother and not really talking to her. And just, that would go months without saying anything. And there was a period of one point in which my dad had to kick me out because he thought I wasn't doing much. And that's when I decided to go the whole entrepreneur route, begin to do different home-based businesses. And the first one I got involved with cash gifting. I lost about close to a thousand bucks. But I want to keep going because I realized through that experience that like I could see that when you work for yourself, the freedom you have, the earning potentials there of like earning what you want because you're charging people for what you want, or you're involved with a company that allows you to earn a lot without being capped. You're not paid on your hours, paid on your performance and stuff. Now was the now was the interesting time in my life where I went down this slope financial this financial downfall, where I lost my car, I didn't have insurance. I declared bankruptcy at the age of 27. Um, there was a period from when my dad kicked me out because he felt like I wasn't doing anything. 
I wasn't, well, there's a point where I was in school and I went back in school. And then that point I was living, I was basically, I went homeless for, for a good point where I moved from one friend's house to the next and they all felt bad for me because I couldn't take care of myself, which is, which is really, 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 uh, not detrimental, but it really digs at you as a person. Especially if you're a dude, where you're like financially, you know, you're, you're supposed to be one when it comes to women, as our society teaches us to provide all the shit. And you can't take care of yourself, you kind of feel like you're like a biggest failure on the planet Earth. And I remember going from one friend's house, moving to the next friend's house, staying there rent free, all this shit, still trying to dodge debt collectors and all the things. It was just, it was very stressful. As much as I wanted, it was happy things, and I didn't realize that this that that, that was also taking toll on me, uh, as far as my self esteem goes. So I look back on these years, and really when, when I look back and I think about it, I go, I didn't even think very highly of myself. I felt like a fraud. I felt like a fucking failure. I felt stupid. Like it affected me talking to women. Like I just went through this period, of, this period of just this this, this down slope of just getting of letting myself get beat up by the external world, letting that define me, and define me as a person who is who I thought was a failure, not a person who was strong and and, and persistent, which which I have, but that for my just sucked so much. So I declared bankruptcy when I finally moved out. I, I was actually was able to move back to my dad's. Um, then I was I was able to move out through some friends of mine and where I am now. Um, but I remember I had declared bankruptcy at age 27. And let me tell you that that was and I'm still my mom issues. Like I still wasn't talking to her. Um, I remember I declared bankruptcy and it, at 27. And I thought I thought I would never declare that. And not on top of that. I was like, I thought, I thought, I, I thought people would only do that when they're like late thirties, forties, fifties, not me. And I remember having come into a decision. When you're, not, when you're not much pressure from debt, and you have to make that decision, there's a stigma attached to, to, to bankruptcy that like, oh my God, you're a fucking failure. Like, how dare you? You know, your credit's gonna be ruined and everything else. And that's when also also I became certified in credit repair. When you had to declare bankruptcy, and no one will tell you this, unless you unless you know people who do, which they won't tell you about because it's embarrassing. Because people look at you like, "Oh my God, what's wrong with you?" Like, there's a stigma, so you, you won't hear about it unless you unless you know your close friends. But when you had to do it, you have two different emotions. You have one of you have, you have one of like, "Oh my God, I can't believe I'm doing this. I'm embarrassed," and you feel guilty and and just feel terrible by yourself. And then two, the other side, the other feeling you have is relief. You go, oh my God, there's hope. I'm gonna be okay. That relief is great. And for me, I was like, ooh, this is great. I felt relief. But on the flip side, beneath, I felt worse. I felt like I felt I felt I reached a low point. Like I was just like a total fear. Like what the hell, man? Like it was bad. I'm like, I'm 27. Why am I doing this? Like it's crazy. So beginning of 2013, I went down to Greenbelt, Maryland to Gord House and declared bankruptcy, which is a very interesting process, by the way. If you ever have to do it, you're not alone. It's not like you're one person. You're in a room, at least in, at least in the state of Maryland, you're, you're in a fucking room with like 20 other people, I'm not kidding you, who are all looking at bankruptcy. You have some woman who sits across from you, that asks you these questions and records you, and you hear, you hear everyone else's shit, and you hear, and you hear oh, one guy who, who was declaring, ba who, who was declaring ba bankruptcy for the second time. I was like, holy shit. Well, I'm not going to do that. But yeah, it's not that bad. It lasts five minutes, ten minutes, and then you're out. And that's it. And the only people who show up is when is when you owe like a lot of money, like 100000 a million, and there's assets involved. And then people show up. But your creditors won't because you, it's just too many people. It's not worth it. It costs them money send, to send someone out there and all that shit. So... So don't worry about it. If you ever have to do it, keep that in mind. And also, your credit doesn't get fucked up. It just goes out, it just goes to zero. And then after that, you want to rebuild it. So yeah, because re really, last thing I'll say about bankruptcy: bankruptcy when you file Chapter Seven is what I did. Chapter Seven is for personal. Um, chapter Thirteen is personal too, but that that's really used for businesses, I think. Chapter Seven is saying, "Fuck it, I'm not paying anything." That's you legally erasing your debts, saying, "I'm not paying you." Boop, and they can't do anything by law. That's what it is. So anyways, I did that. And I remember right before I declared, I declared bankruptcy, I had a huge fight with my mom. And it's all related because all these issues and stuff I was going through, I always felt like every challenge I went through, I wish I had support from, I didn't really talk to my dad about it because I didn't want to say anything. I felt like a failure to him. And my mother, I was like, there's no way in hell I'm going to go talk to her. Fuck that. I don't want to deal with her. I felt like telling her would bring her on more stress and bullshit than 
than me than me just going through it myself. Like I cut her off. There's a long period of time where, you know, even to this day, like I don't consider it to be an option for help. Like I cut her off. I was like, fuck it, I'm not doing it. And I remember the biggest fight her and I got into that we, her and I still need to talk about, but it's funny. It's interesting. Um, it was Christmas morning of 2012. I remember the night before, I went to my best friend Sylvie's house and her family, they're Hispanic, so they celebrate Christmas and Christmas Eve. So while I was, out, I, was at, I was at her house, drinking, dancing, doing whatever, thinking that like all next day we'll wake up at like 12 and keep it chill. And I was gonna run, do whatever. No one told me that like, oh, there's plans for the next day, like as my mom and sister tend to do still to this day, which, which, is, which is interesting. So I remember waking up, my sister waking me up at like 10, and I'm like, what's going on? She goes, you need to get up, we're gonna have like, mom made breakfast and stuff. And I'm like, no, I'm gonna like stay in bed, like screw it. I'm not a morning person, I'm very irritable when I first wake up, so it's working out, it helps me to become friendly. If, if not, I, I feel off for the day, especially in the morning. So my sister then comes back a few minutes later going, Matt, you need to wake up. And I'm like, no, I don't want to. I'm like, I'm going to sleep. Like, no one told me this stuff. So I'm like, screw this. It's, it's, who cares? And then she comes back again. And then at that point, I lose it. We start yelling at each other. My mom hears this, comes upstairs. And she's like, why are you guys yelling? And my sister explains what's going on. My mom says, you know what? No, you're going to eat. Come downstairs, blah, blah, blah. And I was, no, actually, I think I said first. I said, I'm going to run. They want to eat. She goes, no, you're going to eat. I made food. You're going to come downstairs and eat. And my rule is that I still do is I don't eat a big meal before I work out. Uh, if I do eat a meal, I make sure I work out a couple hours later. And if I'm hungry, I'll have something small like Power Bar or something. So I sit so in and tell my mom that. My mom goes, well, no, you're going to eat. And I said, no, I'm going to run. That's why not to do. It's just what I, this is what I, this is part of who I am. I'm not going to eat first. She goes, no, you're going to eat. I said, no, I'm going to run. And that's when the fight between her and I ensued. And she yells at me, I yell at her. And um, and she goes, get in your room, man. Talk, get in your room. I, and I'm standing in the literally, literally in the door doorway of my room. I look up, I I'm, I look up, I look down. I go, yeah, I, yeah, I am, I am in my room. I remember at one point, my mother, we're just yelling at each other, and then she starts to push me. She goes, get in your room. I'm like, I am in my room. I'm not moving. She goes, so then then she starts pushing me. I'm like, why are you pushing me? And she, and she and she and she's like, get in the bed, get in the bed. I said, no, I'm gonna say I'm gonna talk to you because my, my mom is shorter than me, so her power move is to make you sit down while she stands over you to make herself feel like a badass, I guess. I don't know. So we're pushing each other. I'm resisting her like this, like don't push me. She then tries to punch me in my shoulder. I remember that. Yeah, sit in the bed, get in the bed. I said, no, I'm gonna talk to you. I'm gonna sit. I'm gonna stand up and talk. And then at one point she said, don't hit me. I'm like, I'm not hitting you. I'm the one being hit. I'm being defended. She, and she pushes me, tries to punch me, then grabs the long tube of a uh, gift wrapping paper, grabs that, tries to hit me, with, starts hitting me with it. I grab it, put it down, she grabs it again, and she hits me again. I grab it, put it down the ground. I'm like, this is bullshit. And I remember she gave up at that point. It was like, whatever, you need to leave, get up my house. I was like, who cares? I remember one point we were shouting, she goes, this is why I don't respect you, and this is why I don't want you in my house. And I was like, are you kidding me? That's a low blow. And here's what I'm known for. Not known for, a lot of people don't realize. If I know you, if I get pissed off enough, especially if I'm known for years, I know some low blows things I can say if I need to see, if I feel like I need to say it to you, only if I'm provoked. If I'm not provoked, I'm not gonna say that shit. But I will if you go first. That's when I go, all right, you wanna go low? I'll go low too. I know, I know where to hit you where it hurts, emotion, where it stings. And what she said to me was was hurtful. She was like, she's like, I, this is why I don't respect you, which is which is which is hurtful being told by your mother and your son. And then she just then she said, this is why I don't want you in my house. I'm like, the house that you live in, really? At this point, like, whatever. So I remember getting my stuff, trying to hold back tears, like just just being so pissed. My Christmas day was like fucked. I remember going downstairs. I opened the door, and this is why I said there. I turn around and I said, I see why dad divorced you. Slam the door shut. And I was like, fuck you, man. Like, you gonna, you gonna say this, this, you gonna tell me that shit? This is why you don't respect me? This is why you don't want me, want me in your house? I'm gonna say some shit to you too. Door shut. And I remember walking across the street as I'm going down my friend Sylvie's house because she lived like nine a block away. 
screaming out, fucking bitch. And then my mom this day, like, looked outside the door, open door. I think she heard me say it, and she, no, she did. I felt like I'm embarrassed, but at that point, I was like, who cares? I'm walking away, crying, hurtful. Like, what the hell? And I go to my friend's Olivia's house. I told her what's going on. She's like, you can stay with us. I end up running. That Christmas day was the shittiest Christmas, shittiest Christmas, Christmas day of my life. I called my dad. He was in Arizona. I told him what happened. He was like, she hits you? Like, you're kidding me. I'm like, no, dad, that's what happened. I just lost it. Because all I, as far as I was concerned, all I want to do was just do my, my morning routine. And let's eat. And that's it. No, not my mom's house. And some people may argue that's her house, which I get. But... I'm like, it didn't have to get the way it did, and she could have, like, I don't know, could have at least sat down, but it could have been dealt with a lot better than what happened. But to this day, we have not talked about that incident. I have apologized for it at least twice, because at that point, she didn't talk to me for a couple months. I wrote a note, sent flowers, nothing. She didn't respond to anything, didn't acknowledge anything to this day, still not acknowledged my attempt to apologize. And you know, at that point, that's her problem. Because, well, she's still holding on to bullshit. And if you hold on to negative things and anger, you're drinking poison while you're expecting the other person to die. It doesn't work like that. So, while that being said and done, I remember putting myself back into therapy a third time in my life. And, and my therapist had, like, tried to say, he talked to your mom to come back. Asked my mom to come back. My, my mom still said no. My mom has told me once, no, before about going to therapy. I was 15. I remember uh, she was she was at the top of the steps, and out the bottom. I was like, "Mom, I'll go back to therapy. I think it would be good for us." And she said, "No," because I feel like I'm being attacked. And I was like, "Are you kidding me?" And, and when she said no to me, I was like 15, 16. I felt so defeated. I was like, "How can she say this to her own son?" Like I've been rejected by mom like multiple times throughout my life, and it's amazing that I'm not some jacked up individual who's like on drugs and alcohol because. It sucks to be the child and your parents opposite, and the parent is the opposite gender of you and you get that rejection. Rejected by a parent sucks, but it's unique when your son and your mom rejects you or your daughter and your father rejects you. You just go, you gotta be fucking kidding me. Like, I'm your son, I'm your child, and you received your legacy. You're gonna shut me out like that? Well, parents do that. Why? People are people. So, she... Didn't want to go to therapy. I went to therapy again. Over time, what I eventually did was I um trying to make this not go too long. I got to that's when I really started delving into the spiritual side of things. How much reading? I started doing psych K, where you, where you reprogram your subconscious mind. And I remember um doing during a psych K session, I um made a I made the rule of I always remain calm around my mother. And I felt different, and that triggered something in me. It triggered a release of anger that I held, it held, held in for so long. I remember writing a story for some marketing about my mom and the fight we had. And something happened between making that role in that story, where that it was it was like Monday, it was like morning at work. I started writing a letter to my mom saying, "I'm sorry, I love you." Just just just, just going all out. As I'm writing it, I'm crying, and. I remember going to the stairwell, I made a long Facebook post, I got telling her how my mother, I love her, I'm sorry. I posted it and I felt all the anger leave, literally just leave my body. And I went, oh, I went, I'm not angry anymore. Holy shit, this is amazing. Which is, which is like the biggest thing that I, so glad I did to get to, to let go. I finally let go of the anger, and I thought that was going to be the end of it. It's not, but it was a major step where I was like, oh, I'm not angry anymore. She can be her, I'm going to do me, and that's it. I remember that moment, and it felt good to release the anger because that's when the ringworm I was getting stopped. Um, actually, the ringworm stopped because stopped because of anger I had to the mother, and also was holding on to sadness of a friend of mine that I'd lost. So I let that go, let that go too. So, um, from there... As time went on, our relationship, I got to work with um, um, my emotional master coach who lives in New Zealand. I started working on my fears. I started going to work on work energetically. And it was about two years later, a year later, Christmas of 2014, when the unthinkable happened. After all the work I've done myself, which continues to this day, my mom came to me. And it's Christmas, Christmas Day or night before Christmas? 
and she comes up to me and goes, man, I don't talk to you. I was like, yeah. She goes, you know, we are we we used to have a better relationship, you know, and and, and I miss that. I wanna I wanna I wanna get back to that. And I was like blown the fuck away because I didn't think this was ever gonna happen in my life. I thought I was gonna just be it would never happen, but it did. And I was like, wow. I was like, holy shit, this is amazing. This is great. You know, it, it's crazy. Um. And that changed things for the better. It made our relationship better. It still didn't make it where it was before the problems. And to this day, be honest, a relationship still isn't where it could be. It could it, our relationship could be ten times better? Where I'm calling, and we're laughing. It's not because in a relationship you have two parties, regardless if it's a parent child or, or romantic. If one person is going to work themselves and work shit out. The other person doesn't. It cannot ever be where it could be because it takes two people to make it work—a two-way street. And to this day, I continue to work myself and go to seminars if I can. Um, you know, read books, audios, all that stuff. You know, releasing the negative stuff. My mother still refuses to work on her own shit. So therefore, our relationship most likely will never be where it used to be. It could get back to where it used to be before the issues before the issue started up and it could be even better. But because she refused to do that, it can't be. I can't be one carrying the carrying the dead weight. And that was a good moment in my life. I remember that, you know. You know, funny. I remember that. And when I felt good it felt good to be like, wow, like all this shit I've been doing, it hasn't been done in vain, you know. But even then I still I still have more to work on. The longest thing that I you know, I'm gonna fast forward throughout the years I didn't realize I should be a coach until um, how I got into coaching was I I, I did other home based business opportunities you know, different net, different net, different network market companies um, uh, one was an online one through Empower maybe you heard of it wearing one shirts but I remember um, going through it and then I got into uh, uh, Tony Robbins Robbins Madonna's coaching training I didn't complete the course. I want to coach at the, what I thought were business owners on how to get their loans and fix their issues in life, but it didn't work that way, you know. And I started realizing as I started as I started doing more Facebook lives, people were like, "Wow, this is really good! Like you're you're good like coaching people and motivation and stuff." I was like, "Really?" They're like, "Yeah." I'm like, "Okay." And and as I did more videos and stuff like this, people would watch it. My friends would be like, "Wow!" But you you give good stuff. Like I get motivated. I like it. You have a you have a gift. And I'm like. Really? So doubting myself. And then my friends would tell me, Matt, you should be a coach. Like, you're a good life coach. Like, I met other life coaches who are like, you, yeah, you'd be a good life coach. I'm like, really? I'm like, what the fuck? I, I feel like I need certifications to so. But I kept hearing that message over and over and over and over from different people, from mediums and, and people who would meet at work. And I'd be like, okay. And then it's funny, I've been told that more than once. And the universe way of saying, you call anything coaching, fool, do it. So I'm, uh, that's, that's why I started this channel. And that's the short and sweet of it as far as I got into coaching. But the more I would do these Facebook lives, I would tell people about mindset and stuff. People liked it. People liked motivation. I was like, hmm. But the problem was I didn't have a specific problem I wanted to focus on. And that I got that that um, I figured out. Well, it I got help on figuring that out through uh, my emotional master coach, Rebecca McEwen. If you're ever want to look her up. She helped me get rid of my fear of flying. It's, it's pro same process I use for myself. I, I teach people on how to, you know, basically process emotions and just let that shit go, and you can move forward in life. So she helped me figure out what my niche is, which is this: people who have mommy and daddy issues, because a lot of people do. So many. It's an issue that if you do not resolve it. It will continue to affect you for the rest of your life, even after your parents pass away. And it's a bitch because it evolves. You deal with it now while they're alive. It gets stronger when they die because you can't talk to the person anymore. What are you gonna do? It's a lot harder at that point. You can still work through it. It's a little challenging, but you can still do it. So I realized after looking back on the years and the shit I went through talking with her, I was like, with my emotional master coach, it was like. I need to do this because it's, it's something I can relate to. I can speak upon. I have the experience with it. That doing shit, doing that doing shit with my mother, and knowing what it's like to have issues with a parent, knowing what it's like to have issues with the parent that for the parent that with the parent of the opposite gender, and you feel like you are rejected, the parent who's controlling. And in this case, I found out years later, 
with you, who your parent is, the when your parent is the adult child of an alcoholic. That affects how they raise you and, and everything else. And my sister and I, and she's had my sister's had issues with mother, and it's crazy. I won't go into it, but I've had my issues. And I look back at all that. I went through a lot with mother, and still, the biggest thing challenge as I went through issues, I went through therapy three times, psych K, uh, Reiki, energy, book after book after book, seminar after seminar, after seminar. It all came back to this, this energy I had my mother, this issue with her that still that was still up impacting me in a negative way, you know. And so I got an Al Anon because my dad was like, You've been doing this for a long time and the energy you have with your mother is not going away, it's not getting any better. I'm like, Oh shit. I'm like I need to do something. So I had to go a different route. Being in it so far, um, has helped me out with just letting go because the the biggest challenge you'll have with this, with working with your parents that I found, at least for me is accepting the fact that one, you are powerless over them to change them. They're not goddamn thing you can do. Two, accepting them from who they are and taking your attention off of them and onto you so you can heal. Because what we've been trying to do for so long is just trying to change them, provoking them. That's where I've been. I've been the provoker with her. I'm like, I'm gonna take the shit, fuck you, I'm gonna do me. You know, I'm gonna, you can't tell me what to do. And, and as you can see from my story, that that's worked out for me really well. But, two biggest things I can tell you, and it takes time to get there, because you to, you can't just, it's hard to accept someone who you are and be like, and let and let, and let, let it be, and to acknowledge the fact you can't change them, when you still have a lot of emotional hurt to work through. You need to work through that hurt to the point where you're like, Oh, now I can accept them and I can let go. And there's freedom in letting go of the bullshit you have with the person. There's freedom in that. When you let go and accept the fact that you can't do a goddamn thing to change them, when you're really cool with that, you can go, oh, oh shit, I don't have to do this dance anymore. There's freedom in that. You feel better about everything else. So, that is my story. There's more details and stuff which I can share in different videos and things, but I'll let, the, I'll let it be for right now. This has been a long 32 minutes and counting. I hope you got some value to this. Whoever you are watching this, you know, need help, reach out to me. I'm available. I am a coach. I'll help you with this stuff. Okay? I can help you get down to the root issues. Instead of you having to go through years of the bullshit like I did, you can talk to me and I can tell you the shortcuts to get to where you're going to be. It's still going to take work. But hey, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Like this video. Let me know your thoughts or comment. Let me know if you got some value from this. If you got some value, please let me know. I don't want to do this work in vain and have people be like, ah, give me some feedback. Shoot. Anyways, appreciate you. Get in the black. Peace.